I'll be reading from the Inclusive Bible, from chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. Adam and Eve knew each other. And Eve conceived and gave birth to Cain. With the help of God, she said, I have gotten a child. She also gave birth to a second child, Cain's brother Abel. Now Abel became a shepherd and kept flocks, but Cain tilled the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought an offering to God from the fruit of the soil, while Abel, for his part, brought one of the finest of the firstborn of his flock. God looked with favor on Abel's offering, but had no regard for Cain's offering. At this, Cain was filled with rage and despair. Yahweh asked Cain, why are you filled with rage? Why are you downcast? If you intend good, you can hold up your head. If you don't intend good, then sin is a demon haunting your doorway, and it wants you, but you can conquer it. Cain said to Abel, let's go out in the field. When they were in the field, Cain turned on his brother Abel and killed him. God asked Cain, where is Abel, your brother? Cain answered, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? God said to Cain, what have you done? Listen, I hear Abel's blood crying to me from the earth. You will be cursed by the earth, which opened its mouth to receive Abel's blood from your hand. If you till the soil, it will no longer give you its produce. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain answered, this punishment is too great to bear. Since you have banished me from the soil, since I must leave your presence to be a restless wanderer on the earth, anyone I encounter can kill me. No, said God, whoever kills Cain will face sevenfold vengeance. Then God put a mark on Cain so that no one who came across him would kill him. And Cain left God's presence and settled in the land of Nod, or wandering, which is east of Eden. God bless this scripture to our hearing and bless Reverend Anne's preaching for all of our hearts this morning. Amen. <sighs> Thank you, Reverend Kelly. We hope that you're watching us and we thank you so much for just praying. We are praying your healing, your continued healing. So good to be with you today to explore this text in the middle of both what is pride and time of liberation and a remembrance of the six year anniversary of the Pulse uh, nightclub shooting today um, is that anniversary. So first to the family of First Congregational Church of Berkeley and to Pastor Molly and to uh, Reverend Kelly in their absence, I want to say thank you for this kind invitation to share from your pulpit during this what we would think of as Freedom Month of both Pride and Juneteenth. It's true that I have been with you in many capacities over the years, uh, musically speaking, through the work at PSR, but perhaps I think this might be my first time to actually preach here, and I consider it an incredible honor to do so on this particular Sunday. Secondly, I bring you greetings and love this morning from Bishop Yvette Flunder and Mother Shirley Miller and all of your siblings at City of Refuge United Church of Christ from East Oakland to Chicago to the United Kingdom and beyond. We grew tremendously through the time of the pandemic. And finally, I bring you greetings from Pacific School of Religion and President uh, David Vasquez-Levy. 
With our continued gratitude and appreciation for the privilege of holding our first in-person commencement since 2019 here, just a couple of weeks ago. Feels like it's been longer than that now. So I also want to invite you in the spirit of how I preach to, uh, to engage with me. If you hear something uh, that you feel in solidarity with, you are welcome to say amen, to wave your hand, to clap, to just engage. I like a dialogical um, participation. So as we prepare to go forward, I would invite you just first to a moment of silence to remember those um, who were lost six years ago, um, our siblings. And then I invite you to join with me in a word of prayer as we prepare to reflect together on this topic. The pulse of pride. Will the real family values please stand up? Beloved creator and divine lover of us all, thank you for the gift of another day not promised to us. Now in this particular time and on this particular day, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be in acceptable alignment in your sight and life-giving to your people, for you are my rock and my redeemer, the one in whom I live, move, and have my being. These things I pray in Jesus' name and in the name of all that is compassionate, just, true, and divine. Amen and ashe. Because of the nature of this day and even the text from which we are drawing reflections, I find it imperative to say that some of today's content may be triggering, particularly if you have been a victim of targeted violence or abuse. For that, I apologize in advance. I will not sensationalize what occurred six years ago today or even more recently since then but I will reference certain events, and there are references, of course, to blood in our text. And in the lyrics of a song I will refer to later in the sermon, you should know that in preparation for today, I watched the documentary 49 Pulses and was deeply moved and impacted by that. It was my first time to see that. So I invite each of you in advance, whether here or at home, to take care of yourself as you may need to, should such moments occur for you. We are indeed living in somber and traumatic times, and still as the pride-arrayed children of God, we are called to vocations of hope and transformation, and that will be as important a part of our journey together through this word. Come with me now as we explore this text and our times through several considerations, cautionary challenges, and some concluding commitments to which I believe we are called to move us forward in love. As I talked with Pastor Molly about this text, which I know that she preached from a few weeks ago, I noted that what stood out to me about the story was a broader perspective. Is it okay with you if I do take off my mask? I'm just, okay, let me do that so that I don't fog up my own glasses. <laughs> um, what stood out to me about the story was a broader perspective on the potential deadly impact of sibling rivalry. That in fact, as I looked at the text and looked at our world, it seemed as if I could categorize not only what took place between Cain and Abel, but also at the Pulse nightclub in Buffalo, in Uvalde, in Laguna Wood, and throughout our nation and world as toxic sibling rivalry. 
I could see it as I looked at issues between Israel and Palestine, Russia and Ukraine, East Oakland and Minneapolis, Washington DC, Danville, California and Charleston. You, and I could see it uh, within the United Methodist, within the UCC, within disciples and even Lutherans and practically every denomination. There are examples of a perilous sibling rivalry. Well, preacher, what do you mean? Consider with me these things, if you will. First of all, I believe that we are all siblings. That is the creation of God, and not just the two-legged creation, those we call humans, but with all of the created order. We are siblings with all of Mother Earth's inhabitants. But for the most part, we don't truly recognize each other as siblings across our beautiful differences. Would you agree that we are all siblings? Remember, I'm like, I have to, I have to hear <laughs> to know I'm on the right track. Um, with respect even to the perpetrator at the Pulse, the recording of his conversations indicated he considered himself not a sibling, but a soldier of God. And we are often in trouble when we take on the identity of being soldiers of God and not siblings within God's family. Since we are siblings, we are our siblings keepers. How many of you uh, in the audience are oldest siblings within your family? Okay, and so you have some experience with having been charged with the responsibility for your younger ones, like no matter what they were doing, where's your little one, where's your little brother, where's your little sister, where's your little sibling? But yes, we are. We are our siblings' keepers. That was Cain's first question back to God when God said, where is your brother? And Cain, knowing what he had done, said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Too many of us, it's too easy to say, I don't know, am I my sibling's keeper? But we are responsible, I believe, for the well-being of one another. So and even as we look around and wrestle with climate change, even that, if you take what I'm saying seriously, is a form of sibling rivalry because we have sought to dominate and to extract from our mother, sister Earth, and she has responded in kind, fighting for her very life through floods and through fires and through torrents, and she cries, her blood cries from the Earth. Sibling rivalry, I believe, emanates from a perspective of scarcity, jealousy, and fear. So let me tell you a little personal story. Uh, I happen to be an only child. Uh, no brothers, no sisters of the flesh, many chosen family. But as an only child, I tended to be very, very jealous of my parents' affections because it seemed to me somehow that they could not possibly have enough love uh, for me and for anyone else they directed their attention to. But not only that, there seemed to be something inside me that was afraid that somehow in loving other children, they would begin to prefer that child over me. Have you ever felt like that? That somehow there would not be enough love for you and for someone else, particularly if they were different from you, particularly if you had some admiration for some quality uh, that they had, that somehow their love would replace the love that is for you. In fact, we heard the echoes of that from Charleston when people said, the Jews will not replace us. The underlying uh, part of, of, of sort of the white replacement theory is a fear. It's a fear. So sibling rivalry and the actions that result from that, toxic sibling rivalry, let me say toxic sibling rivalry, 
comes from a place of scarcity and not really understanding the power of love and the immensity of God's love for her creation. We don't know from this text whether or not Abel taunted Cain with God's acceptance of his offering or not. The text doesn't tell us that. It simply says that Cain tended toward an attitude of mediocrity that Cain did not bring forth his best and then was angry that what he brought was recognized for what it was in truth. And he allowed that anger to turn into rage and rage turned into murder. There are many who refuse to see their own deeds in truth and despise the beauty of their siblings in queer community, in communities of color, in immigrant communities, in you could go on, on. They do not see us and sometimes we do not see others as our kinfolk on this tiny planet called Earth, which we must share. But consider this that God loves and cares about all of her children, even those that make us mad as hell. Even those that rise up against us. You will note that in this text, as we go farther, Cain cries out for mercy, and God grants the mercy of a protective mark so that Cain will not experience the same thing that he perpetrated on his own sibling. What kind of God do we serve? God's justice is not like ours. (sighs) Well, thinking about toxic sibling rivalry and how it shows up. Think about how does it show up even in your own life, in your own community, in our own congregations, in our own associations, in our own counties and states and districts. It's a muck running amok everywhere as we come time and time again to the same tired uh, 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 mantra of thoughts and prayers. But when will Will there be change? Toxic sibling rivalry is uh, running rampant. But there's an antidote. I believe that there is an antidote, that we hold the antidote. And I talked about the pulse of pride. First of all, the definition, we all know that the definition of a pulse, in fact, I invite you to just hold your hands to your wrist or to the side of your throat. The pulse, uh, pulse is defined as a rhythmical throbbing of the arteries as blood is propelled through them, typically felt in the wrist or neck. It's also uh, defined as a single vibration or a short burst of sound, electric current, light, or other wave. Both kinds of pulses were uh, in full effect uh, that night at the, on a Latin night at the Pulse nightclub. Love was in the air, celebration. Celebration, joy, acceptance, and welcomes, and for some, even reconciliation. People who hadn't seen each other in a while connected that evening, not knowing what was to come. Both of those things were in full effect at the club. Both were silenced by toxic sibling rivalry. Yet in the face of that, there is another pulse that was at work or that continued to be at work beyond that particular action. I want to invite you, as you think about pride family values, there's so much talk about family values, but so many of those things are anything but family values. But in the celebration of pride, these are some of the values that I see at work. Love, celebration, acceptance, welcome, beauty, unfettered joy, liberty and liberation, creation and choosing of family, 
authenticity, shelter. What else would you name as a family value of pride? Generosity. Hope. Self-confidence. Integrity. Caring. Self-love. Mercy. Gratitude. Respect for each other. These are important family values, and these are the values that I think are most important to our mother, father, God. Within that documentary, Patty Sheehan, who is the, the Orlando District 4 Commissioner, said these words as she was interviewed. She said, I just want to say that we as a gay, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender community are a people who love. And if you think you are going to stab at the heart of us by doing this horrible, violent act, you're not. Because we love, we are a resilient people and we're going to show you in the face of this that we're going to have people lined up behind those blood banks and people came from everywhere, all across the country, all lifestyles, all uh, identities, uh, all expressions, gender expressions came to support that community. She said, we're going to show you the good heart of humanity, not the horrible, bad part. That's what we have the opportunity to do as we root ourselves into the family values of pride, to counter toxic sibling rivalry. In fact, we want to move today from sibling rivalry to sibling solidarity, from rivalry to solidarity. That's where the hope lies for us to transform the world, even in the midst of everything that we see, solidarity wins. Love wins. In fact, another person in the, the uh, documentary said that somehow even in the midst of that, this was the time that love overcame hate. Love always wins. I don't care what it looks like right now or today. Love wins. And we must believe that and we are called to be that. There are a couple of cautions that I want to say and cautionary challenges. We cannot assume that, that being rooted in LGBTQIA plus acceptance and celebration uh, automatically exempts us from the sibling rivalry, the toxic sibling rivalry that manifests as racism or ageism or classism or sexism or ableism or any of the other uh, isms that we can think of. Just because we have it down in one area does not mean that we do not have to strive for solidarity across multiple areas. Healthy pride, I believe, is rooted in the humility of recognizing our essential place in humanity, that our place is essential, but it is not the only place. We too are part of a spectrum and we can uh, become caught up not only in uh, rivalry in other areas, but also we can become caught up in the hate that is directed toward us. There was a song written, how many, I don't know how many of you have heard of the um, songwriter Susan Werner. Do you know that name, Susan Werner? Um, she wrote, um, uh, she did a project, she's done many projects. Queer songwriter from, from Iowa, from the middle of the country. But she did a project once called The Gospel Truth. And one of the things that I would declare as a uh, pride family value, what I've seen in 
queer communities and what I have seen in African American communities and other communities is the family value of forgiveness. The willingness to extend mercy. She wrote a song once called Forgiveness which is so profound. She says, part, in part of it, she says, how do you love those who, who never will love you? Who are happy to shove you out in front of the train. How do you not hate those who would leave you lie bleeding while they hold their prayer meeting? How do you love those who never will love you, who are so frightened of you, they are calling for war on, they're calling for war on queer bodies, they're calling for war on women's bodies, they're calling for war on immigrants' bodies, they are calling for war on the bodies of children and trans children. How do you not hate those who have loaded their Bibles and arm their disciples because I don't know anymore and I can't find forgiveness for them anywhere in this and with God is my witness I really have tried how do you love those who never will love you I think only God knows and God is not taking sides I hate that line I want God to take sides <laughs> to tell you the truth I hope one day God shows us how we can love those who never will love us, but who still we must love. Why, God? What I believe is that God is on the side of love. And that if we find ourselves on the side of love, and I'm not talking about, you know, Hallmark kind of movie, you know, just I'm talking about hard work, labor, love, love that holds people accountable for their wrongdoing even while making room for grace that they might be able to be transformed by the power of love and even if they are not we leave that to God to deal with. We are called to love. We are called to move from rivalry to solidarity because we have to believe that ultimately love wins the lovers win feels like a rough time that we're in now and doesn't just feel like it we are in a rough time At the time of the Pulse nightclub shooting, it was at that time the largest mass shooting in America. But one year later, another one topped that in Las Vegas. And the shootings just keep coming because somehow Love is not winning among our legislators, not yet. But when our sibling rivalry moves to solidarity and we move in step with those who are marching on the side of love, like the high schoolers that organized the March for Our Lives yesterday in San Francisco and the children and people, hallelujah, who moved all over the country. I'm sorry, something Pentecostal slipped out there. I said hallelujah. Just bear with me. But when I think about the power of love to cause us to rise up in solidarity, with one another, with our siblings, first of all, to recognize that even through our differences, we are family, we are one blood. And when the blood of any is shed, it cries up from the ground to our creator. And God asks us, what have we done? What are we doing? What will we do to move ourselves from rivalry with the earth and rivalry with each other? And these times of again and again to solidarity. 
Dr. Robin Henderson Espinosa quotes Mary Oliver in uh, their latest a book, Body Becoming. There exist 1,000 unbreakable links between each of us and everything else. The farthest star and the mud at our feet, the pine tree, the leopard, the river and ourselves. We are either at risk together or we are on our way to a sustainable world together. We are each other's destiny. So if we want to really celebrate pride and celebrate the real family values, hatred is not a family value. Exclusion is not a family value. But if we want to celebrate the pride of being a beautiful and inextricable part of the universe, of being an intentional expression of our Creator's majesty and boundless love, then we're called to know, first of all, that there is enough love for us all. And we are called to know that when we have come to the end of our own capacity to love, we can find our resources regenerated in the company of our siblings. When we rise up together, when the real family values uh, stand up and make room for those who are houseless or, or those who are the excluded, whether they look like us or not, whether they talk like us or not, whether they dance or move or clap on the same rhythm or not, if they are clapping on the one and three or the two and the four, we still can find a rhythm together. We must because if we don't, we will become victims to toxic sibling rivalry. But God is calling us to something greater, to the transformative power of love. And even if we are making mistakes along the way, and we will, God still has mercy. And we have the power. I imagine when I think about Cain and the story of Cain's descendants, how often must he have told the story of what he did and of how God saved him and enabled him to go forward in a new way. We have the power. We are our siblings' keepers. We are each other's destiny. May God infuse us with the power of Pentecost and pride and liberation. May we transform the world wherever we go and wherever we are. God bless you and amen.